بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Assalamu alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear brothers and sisters, welcome to Youth Hour. Uh, I'm Isha Kuddin. And like always, mashallah, we bring in a special um, guest for you. And inshallah, we get inspiration from them. I'm very honored to have today two special persons. And you will be also honored when, once you are uh, after the show. I'm sure you guys are going to call us. Also, you can call us and share your views as well. We'll take a few calls, inshallah. Um, our topic today is connecting communities. So we're going to talk about in the UK, we're going to talk about in Bangladesh. So our guest today is they're specialized in uh, Bangladesh, actually. I'm really honored to have them. So let me introduce them first. On my far left, um, Ken, how are you? Welcome to our show. Yeah, Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much. And then we have his uh, wife, um, Vicky, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Come on, Ken. Thank you. You know, I'm, I'm in Palawasi. Thank you. <laughs> so how much you learned uh, Bangla? You, I know your first journey, you went to Dhaka in then three months, you learned Bangla. How much did you learn in Bangla? Well, that was when we, we did the Dhaka uh, part uh, on our third trip. In actual fact, when we went to live in Bangladesh, the first two times we actually had no Bangla at all. Uh, so we were very kind of helpless Badeshis and uh, kind of re reliant on all our friends who looked after us. But but yes, the third time uh, when we moved out in 2008, we spent uh, three months in Dhaka learning Bangla. Um, and I'm afraid to say, you know, I'm a Bangla, Kupalumna. <laughs> it's not good at all. Um, but uh, I get by. Yours is much better, though, isn't it? Motomoti. Motomoti. Okay, that's great. You know, your journey in Bangladesh, I'm really interested in because you're also writing a book on that. First yes. time, Ken, I don't know if, I, if I'm right, I've seen you in one of the TV in Bangladesh, and you are celebrating other f um, 21st of February, Ekushi February, or probably Independent Day. You were wearing a, 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 a traditional um, long, not longi. Kind of a, uh, you, uh, for the TEDx talk? Yeah. yeah. Something uh, like I wore a longi for, for my TEDx talk, yeah. That was uh, to, to introduce a very different concept to the largely Western audience that were going to be watching what I was talking about. So for them, I, it was a very strange thing for a man to be wearing, really. Amazing. I think that actually shows that like, we live in a world that is not very far, but it is far. Yes. Mm. You know, you, within t five minutes, as soon as you took your longi off, you was a different person. Indeed, yes. Yeah. And before that, I, was, I watched it and I was, I was amazingly feel, oh, wow. What an amazing message you're giving, actually. Look, I'm the same person, mm. but look at me. And how, what would people think, mm -hmm. assuming things? So dear viewers, um, Ken and his wife, actually, they lived in Bangladesh, and they've done amazing stuff, and we're going to go through that. And if you have any special stories, please share with us as well, inshallah. I'm going to go to Vicky first, because she went to Bangladesh first. And please tell me your journey through Bangladesh. So first time you've been there, what was your feeling? How did people accepted you and how people welcomed you? It would be interesting. And how did you get Ken going as well? <laughs> the first time I went, um, I was quite naive. I'd only ever been to uh, Europe. I'd never been further than France and Spain. Um, and I was naive in thinking that everybody would speak English and it would be similar in what I was used to. And I can remember arriving, the smells were different, the people were different, the sounds were very different. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't make the shower work. And I'd gone to work at the hospital for two weeks. And I was expected to see patients and treat patients and I couldn't speak to them and I couldn't, I, I just couldn't survive in knowing what was going on. But the people were just so patient and they taught me and they looked after me and they actually did facilitate me to, to be able to work. Um, and when I came back, it was almost like the world had changed because I'd been open to so many colours and so many feelings and so much different, different views and different expectations that when I came back and I'd left Ken with two very little children, came back to them and said, look how small the world is, look how much we can learn. And he was still in the place of, 
I'm in Cumbria, I've just done two weeks work. So it took a while for us to realign our, um, our views and our goals. And he eventually came with me again for a trip with the family to see where I'd been and what I'd done. Wow. You know, first time when I went there, 20 years ago actually, so I came out of the plane. <laughs> and it was almost like I was going to the oven, honestly. Yeah. Yes. It, was, it, it was like that. But I was born there actually. I was born there. And um, I know Ken always says he loves Bangladesh. And, and it puts shame on me actually, because <laughs> I haven't been there for 20 years, honestly. And my younger, younger son, they haven't been there in the second. I've got three boys. So as soon as I know, when you said uh, you wrote a book on Shunali, and I said, wow, I got to meet him, and, and I got to see that person. Can tell me your experience as well, because she made a lot of friends, and she, you could see from UK, we have a life of luxurious. Mm. Mm. You, know, you, you, you don't get <coughs> beyond that. It's absolutely the top class. That's probably why I like it. <laughs> 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 Maybe not. Um, and you actually, and she approached you and said, come and see something else. There's something special there. Please yeah, tell me. Yeah, uh, uh, to, uh, to putting a bit of flesh onto what Vicky was saying about my reluctance, uh, it, it wasn't what you might think that it was like, I was thinking, oh no, I'm very happy in, in my own country and I, I don't want to know about something else. Actually, out of the two of us, Previously, in, in, in our courting years, Vicky had won wondered whether she wanted to, to marry me at all because I was always, yeah, I'm going to go all over the world and I want to do all sorts of things. And she was like, no, I'm a good Cumbrian lass. <laughs> I want to stay put here. Um, and I calmed down a bit and got used to having a job and enjoying teaching. But I think uh, more than anything, I'm a very relational person. For me, I'm very much about making relationships with people, making connections with people. Um, and I'd already made that with the school that I was working at in Cumbria. I had eight very happy years uh, as uh, head of uh, department there, or de sorry, deputy head of department there. And uh, th it was just a wonderful time. I got to know a lot of people and had a great time. And here was Vicky come back saying, there's this amazing place, amazing opportunities. There's a school there. They're crying out for teachers. You've got to come out and, and have a look. And I was like, actually, I've got my place where I'm, I'm doing good things with people. Uh, and I like that. Um, and I didn't need that bigger world view in a sense. I already kind of got what she'd been telling me about in emails and things like that. But I, we came out because Vicky needed it, because she was in a different place and she needed us to be gelled together as a, as a, as a unit, as a family again. Um, and so I got, I got dragged along, you know, is that how I put it. But there was a flip side to that, and that was when we got there, um, I think for a lot of people going out to Bangladesh, like you say, you get hit by those smells, those sounds, as, as Vicky did to a certain extent, and it's like, my goodness, this is, this is so much. And for some people, it's too much. It's just actually very uncomfortable. And we've seen people go to Bangladesh and go away from it, saying, we'll never come again. It was, it was just, it was too hot, it was too noisy, it was too smelly. But there are other people who absolutely get it. And I completely got it. Um, and in a sense, I got it more than I've ever really felt in this country. I remember sitting in, in the guest house at, at our NGO on our very first night there uh, back in 2006 and feeling, I've come home. And it was this very strange thing. Here's a place I've never been to before and I feel like I've actually come home to the real home. Um, and that has never gone away. You know, that's 11 years later, I still feel um, every time I go to Bangladesh now, it's like I, I go through those, those doors of the air-conditioned airport yeah, and you're hit by that heat and it's like, ah, yes, I'm, I'm here. home. Yes. I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> Vicky, if I could ask you, what's that special thing that you changed your way of seeing things? I think it's a flip side of, of ideals. But is it the people? Is it the way they think? So is it the <laughs> yes, <laughs> all of it. Um, I think I was trying to work this through just recently, and I, I think a lot of it's around. Um, we're very complacent in the UK, as you say. Everything is is ideal. Everything is is the dream, clean, um, non-corrupt. Um, all the we have everything we need. And that takes away from the need to actually really feel. And when, when you go to Bangladesh and the resources aren't there and they, they're struggling on a daily basis to, uh, to, to make ends meet, it's about resilience and it's about not expecting the world to give you something, but to be happy with what you've got. 
and that the actual acceptance of being happy with what you've got I think is the, is the big thing that I came away with is to be content wherever you are because all my Bengali friends are all content and happy with life mm. and happy with who they are. Did you feel surprised that people normally, the, the places you've been to, it's really a, a poor area, isn't it? Mm. And really, really they don't have access to outside world almost. Mm. And did you feel surprised that they are happy? I mean, they don't have, they have a small dream. That's fine. They're happy within their dreams. And here, I say, if you ask my dreams, it's too many. It's too many. Uh, you're never going to fulfill those dreams. Mm. But they are still nothing and still happy. Yes. And it, it, it's surprising initially if you've never seen it before, because some would go and say, how can you possibly be happy having nothing, sleeping on the floor, having no roof over your head, having one meal a day, not getting enough to have meat or or different foods or just even meeting your basic needs and yet they have community they have each other and they have something that we would never be able to have here they have richness that that we get taken away from us with materialism I think. Who are the first people you met then when I mean, you met there you made your friendship with? Um, I think probably. I love you to tell them because they are watching now. I think probably the first person that I remember, the first two people I remember were the, um, the nursing director, Bulbuli, and the medical director at the time, um, Nelson, who w were the first two leaders within the hospital to, to meet us as Badeshis and to take us um, and say, this is what we need you to do for a couple of weeks to help people have some respite. Um, but then they took us into their families and into their homes and into their hearts, really, and just looked after us properly as 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 one of their community you know I, was, I went through your Facebook and, and um, I've seen those pictures like with people around you the young people mm. and their mothers and you're eating with them and you are talking to them you're playing with them it's, it's amazing I have never seen anybody do, you know do similar things like you doing it you sit with them in the floor and you are playing with them and it's almost like you are the bigger brother <laughs> You know, you know, in, in that type. Mm -hmm. Did it take you long to be like that, or you already had in your head, I'm going to go and mix with them? Um, I think it was partly the ethos that was already established at the school, at Lamb School, um, where um, there was definitely uh, the feeling of we're being a family. And indeed, Lamb School started, uh, the NGO Lamb itself started about 40, I think it's about 40, 45 years ago now, I think something like that. And Lamb School started maybe 15 years, 20. 15, 20 years ago, something like that. But it literally started with one man and a couple of kids um, and a, one single room, uh, you know, in order to try and give some education to kids of staff who were already working at the place. Um, and the school grew and grew and grew. We've now onto the, the third building which is now huge and we've got hundreds of, of children working there. Um, when I came it was still quite a small school but that that family sense that had started right from the beginning of just you know one guy and a couple of kids was still there. All the staff are referred to as uncle or auntie so I was Uncle Ken which, which sounds strange in this country but over there was just that was just yeah. part of part of the way it was. We were all just kind of family together. We all helped out sweeping the the classrooms at the end of every single day. Um, uh, we all sat on the floor together. We all ate and shared together, and, and so on and so forth. And I, that was exactly me. That was again, it's that kind of relational thing. There was no need for class discipline as such. The kids wanted to be there. They loved learning. They were friendly. They were helpful. Uh, you knew their parents. You probably you know would go for dawa to their house and things like that regularly enough uh, and it was just very very friendly so no there was, there, it was an, an immediate transition for me it's like yep I'm straight in there and I've been told before today that you know I'm a big kid at heart really and you know I have a good sense of humor and I, I, I do the odd little kind of like card tricks and things like that and I would do all this kind of stuff to to amuse the kids as well uh, and, and I, would, I was similar to how I used to teach in, in England as well. I didn't feel I'd had a good class if I hadn't made the whole class laugh at least once during the lesson kind of thing. I wanted them to have fun while they learned. And in, in Bangladesh at, at the NGO, it was just such a natural thing. You could play with these kids and they would learn through your example. They would pick up on your words and they would just 
soak it all in. Uh, and to my knowledge, they still do that to this very day. You know. Vicky, did he, give, did he give you a big thanks? Because you actually changed his life. <laughs> <laughs> it was you, wasn't it? At least you pulled him. It's interesting listening because actually I think that's who he was before we went anywhere. And I think as, as a couple, our ethos has always been to get alongside people wherever, mm. um, to empower people to be the best that they can be wherever. And the changing country really was just a, a change in mindset for what we were doing already. Um, coming back has been harder. Mm because that's almost been shocked out of us in the opposite culture shock direction. But um, yeah, I think that's who we were anyway. Okay, when you were there, do you miss home? Do you, do you miss UK? I miss family yeah, and that's... friends and occasional things that you can't get to eat, maybe like tomato ketchup and things like that. Um, you could buy it there. <laughs> it's, it's not, not the same. same. <laughs> And also expensive, isn't it? Very. Yeah. Yeah. Very expensive. Very expensive, yeah. There were some things that you, you do realise that um, you will not compromise on in life, like pillows um, and duvets. So just little things that um, make the difference. But apart from that, actually, I miss Bangladesh more than I missed England. Oh, God bless you, man, honestly. I feel so sad that uh, I don't miss it at all. Because <laughs> I, I, I love being in England um, for a few reasons, honestly. Of course, I'm proud I'm, I'm Bangladeshi. There's mm -hmm. no doubt in it. And in this country, what I love is freedom. Mm -hmm. Everyone has a, a, a fair trial or fair things. You, you, could, you could talk about yourself, who you were. It doesn't matter. No mm -hmm. one's going to stop you or question you. Um, you know that you're going to get justice. More or less, no. I mean, it's, honestly, I mean, if I compare with Bangladesh, I'm Bangladeshi. I could say that. Very difficult in Bangladesh to get justice. If you have money, it's different. Mm. Not always, but majority of the time. Here, I'm f I'm f free. I could choose what I wanted to, and 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 I have a say in, in everything I want to do. And you could change things. And that's the beauty I, I like of U UK and. Um, we hope, you know, one day uh, it's, it's, it's a global thing. We are learning and we are passing. You guys are going there, changing things around. And also people, young people here learning, they're probably going to could pass the good thing from here too. So you bring and take and give and That might change things around, hopefully. We're going to go for a small break. After the break, we'll talk about your food. <laughs> we'll, talk about, we'll talk about your food and we talk about, you know, how did you made your... Um, uh, sardines. I don't know what you make actually. In, in Bangladesh, it's quite difficult to cook it, but isn't it? Oh, is it the same as here? Um, <laughs> it is different. It's a different way of cooking. It's a different mindset in terms of what you want to actually eat. So, did you use the cooker? They mostly use the, um, the wood um, cooker, isn't it? Like, it's more like a mud cooker. We had a butane gas, um, we were using like gas. a camping okay. stove. But you've seen people doing it, I'm sure. Um, yes, people. yeah, our yeah. village Have you tried that? Um, yeah, the the mud yeah. chulas were there, yeah. Yeah, on the, the big pans. Yeah, have you tried that? Um, oh. I have, and we had um, in the rehab centre, we made food for the hospital and for the rehab patients. So we had an indoor chula with a, a, um, a chimney um, that was made out of, it was a, a proper chula. Um, but it was inside in one of the rooms to make a, a, a cooking kitchen for the rehab centre. So that, that was an interesting experience when one of the days the staff members weren't in, it was a weekend, and I had to light the chula to make the tea for the hospital. It took a lot longer than they took. How about the smell? Because of the, you get lots of uh, smoky yeah. things, isn't it? Depends on your wood. If it's dry, it's cool, it's like a charcoal, and if it's not dry, and it's, it, it could be a disaster. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. um, the wood was well prepared. They were very organised mm -hmm. staff, and the wood was well prepared, um, even if I wasn't very effective at lighting it. Fantastic. Okay, let's go for a break. Dear brothers and sisters, you could call in and share your views as well. And um, just like I said, we can learn a lot of things. If you have kids around you, please get them to see, see us, and they will feel proud of Bangladesh too, inshallah. I'll see you after the break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear viewers, welcome back.
to you, Tawa, again, and mashallah. I was enjoying talking to Ken and Vicky, uh, their journey in Bangladesh. So we're going to talk about, um, I'm going to ask Ken regarding his writing stick skills he's using in Bangladesh hmm. as well. So you wrote a book called Sunali. I did. Amazing. Yeah, uh, it's a book. And uh, this it was largely a collection of uh, photographs taken from the area up in the northwest of Bangladesh where we lived. And uh, these were just memories for me, my, my fondest memories, like cooking from the, the, the earth chulas and, uh, and things like that, living in the village, uh, watching people at, at work, uh, the train lines that ran behind our NGO and things like that. And um, I deliberately made these black and white photographs because even though Bangladesh is a beautiful country, it's just so, you know, the fields are richly green, the, the sun is just an amazing orangey red colour as it goes down and, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, the gold isn't in that, the gold is in the people and you don't need the colour photographs for that, the, you want the exact opposite of that, you know, it's the lifestyle, the, the character, the, the, the hearts of the people, that is actually the, you know, Shanali, uh, not the, the beautiful land, which is something that first impacts upon you when you go there, that's the first thing you think, it's a beautiful place, but actually it's the people who are really golden. If you could give us an example of uh, what really touched your heart, like that person done this, in characters were like, oh. I went to this house, they didn't have food at all, but they gave me that, and that really touched me. Well, I think... A few examples. Where w we lived, we didn't live in, apart from our training in, in Dhaka for And you for can name months, those people, I think they'll be proud to... Well, apart from that training, we weren't really in any kind of rich kind of area at all. We were um, up in the middle of nowhere in the northwest, amongst some of the, the poorest of the poor, you know, uh, in Bangladesh. Um, even our NGO, which had a you know a reasonable amount of uh, mod cons, we had running tap water and things like that, which was nice. But our medical directors didn't have their own cars and chauffeurs and things like that. You know, they had to get rickshaws and uh, van garries like everybody else. You know, they, they, it wasn't about getting rich. Yeah, we we lived as much as possible, similar to the standards of everybody else. But even so, in the villages, which were just on the outskirts, um, people were living in mud huts. There, they were living with very little. And, um, and it was those people that we were used to being with, who we called our friends, um, who we enjoyed uh, spending time with. And that was, that was the most amazing thing, when you can go into somebody's home and it is clear that they have very, very little uh, to live off. And yet they will feed you a, a sumptuous meal uh, and they will lavish every possible attention on you. And, and I remember in our very first year of going, um, going for a meal there and uh, suddenly two guys as we we're eating come in with this massive huge TV set and they carry it in and put it on and they spend about 10-15 minutes desperately trying to ch tune in a channel of black and white TV for us and it was you know this is clearly not a TV that was being used at the time it was it was brought because we, we were the guests and they'd been rallying around in, the, in behind the scenes to get this so that we could watch Bangla TV, <laughs> which at the right. time we didn't understand a word of, but, uh, but it was just that kind of generosity of, of spirit and, and, and love. Uh, and the people we knew very, very well, um, and I can think of the, the woman who was our maid, our Aya, her name was Shirola, and uh, she's just one of the most amazing women I've ever met in my life, and, and, and she's exactly the kind of person that, that I'm talking about, um, you know, very little in her village. And yet, I've never met somebody so contented, so generous, so kind, so just at peace with themselves mm. and, and the world. And we knew her very, very well. We still know her. Uh, that it's her village that we go to whenever we go to Bangladesh. We're just immediately back there because th that's where we m feel most comfortable. You recently comfortable been to home. Bangladesh, isn't it? Last year, yeah, this just year. this January. I went. This yes, January. Indeed. So uh, you were there for five years. The so beginning of five years, and now, have you seen the differences? Yes. A huge difference. I think in that time um, the whole economy has grown um, and just as we were leaving in 2000, uh, beginning of 2014, um, our house overlooked the, the main road out of the village and when, when I arrived there was no internet. The emails had to be downloaded onto a box and taken to Dinajpur and once a day the emails went and then the box came back so in Dinajpur the Philippines. Dinajpur is like a town. Dinajpur yeah, is the, the local big local town. City, yeah. um, and there was there were a handful of cars, um, very few people in suits, people worked the land, people um, worked in houses. 
and then by the time we left there was cars everywhere there was much more of a middle class building up and growing which was wonderful to see because you can see the country developing but mm. it also did lose some things because then I think rather than it it showing that the country was growing in wealth actually what happened is the poverty gap just got bigger so the people who were our friends were actually just almost getting poorer mm. as other people who had managed to get the education and and get the input from other societies were getting richer and the two weren't actually helping each other which m was quite sad in some ways. Do you do celebrate Eid or those festivals in Bangladesh like Ekushi February yes. or yeah, Independent Day? How was it? Give us an example. Victory Day. Yeah. Eid was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm much fattening. food. So <laughs> much food because you got you got Dawat's invitations um, regularly so everybody who um, who was Muslim and we had a lot of Muslim friends all gave us an invitation so it, it kind of became to the point where you actually had to timetable your day so you started off at one friend's for breakfast and then it worked through the day from there and, and by the end of the day four, five, <laughs> six meals Easily, um, and yeah. people were just so generous and the food was just amazing and just to share it with us um, who, in when we wouldn't normally ce celebrate Eid here, it, it was something special. Did they ever ask you, like, do you follow any religion? Did they ever have the hesitation asking, you know, I'm a Muslim and is she a, a from a different, um, what's that background? Did they ever ask you anything like that? I don't think they ever had to because they knew we were Christians. Um, we, were, we were working within a Christian NGO. So they didn't have no problem um, with that? They had no problem. The, the NGO they was... They shouldn't be. No, the NGO was very much a mix. Mm. Um, it was Christian-led, but it was a mix of Muslims, Hindus... Um, tribal groups. Tribal groups yeah. all working together for... The, the, the motto of the organisation is um, so that all may ab have abundant life. Um, so it was about meeting the needs of the population. But do you feel, because you've been in that place, do you feel there are some NGOs are preaching? Is there any NGOs you think that they're only there for preaching and they're actually giving a bad name to all other NGOs that are doing amazing work in the community? Well, I don't think we've ever experienced that ourselves, have we, at all? No. Um, um, I think it's a danger that people can fall into but I think very quickly it becomes apparent that that's not going to work mm. in terms of meeting people's needs because that's not what people need. People need their physical needs and their emotional needs and they need relationship. They need to learn truly as we need to learn as much from them. Um, my time in Bangladesh didn't teach. I, I gave very little. I actually gained much more than I gave. It's amazing, right? Yeah. Amazing. I, w I would You must be very proud of her. I mean, every word she's saying is she means it. I can see it in her eyes and when she says it, she feels it, honestly. That's, that's the beauty of it. Well, honestly, uh, from, from my point of view, Vicky is the reason we, we were out there. And uh, she, she was the legitimate person uh, doing, doing, doing the work out there. As far as I was, con I was playing with the kids in the school, you know, you know, as far as I was concerned. Even teaching O-levels um, and uh, you know, helping kids to get qualifications and things like that. Well, you know, that's, that's something that's pretty straightforward for me. I've just had a, a lot of fun doing it. But Vicky was working day in, day out. Um, not always just in our NGO, but uh, LAM has a lot of uh, field clinics um, out and about, and she was often, you know, she'd be gone for a day or two at a time, um, you know, going right out into the sticks, into the villages themselves, where, where the, the need is often the greatest, and people can't get to the, the hospital mm -hmm. NGO where, where we were, and, and she'd be doing that. And the stories she used to, to tell, uh, every day she'd come back, uh, uh, just the most amazing thing. And of course, it isn't just Vicky, because I don't want to kind of, you know, make her head bigger than it needs to be. But, um, her, her team, her whole team, yeah. just did an amazing work. You, you could say much more than me than that, really. <laughs> well, I'll come to her. I think she's emotional. <laughs> <laughs> um, Shunali, so if I ask you, you say, I know you are really, you like Bangladesh, and you said, I love Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do, can you say a few lines like Amashina Banglagan? Oh my goodness, no, no, don't ask me to do that. When I read Bangla or speak Bangla, I sound like a child. In fact, most of my friends... Can you read Bangla? Yes, I can read okay, Bangla. So can you say a few lines then, if you don't mind? <laughs> okay. If you have any point Well, I'll, I'll be, re well, I'll be okay. a slight cheat, actually, because um, 
uh, the English, for, uh, I originally okay. wrote this book in English and then I was immediately Aww. asked by people learning Bengali, he says we want it in Bangla as well, so um, so I then had it translated into, into Bangla. I didn't do the translating, it was a, a good friend of mine, a woman called Jasmine Chowdhury with whom I'm currently writing another book about our experiences. She, she lives here but she's from Bangladesh and of course I spent some time in, in Bangladesh so we're writing books about being Bideshis in each other's country and, and looking at different things like that. So she did the translation work and did a fantastic job but I, but I can read it for this one, you know, um, Amaranago Shagatom, you know, uh, welcome to my kitchen, you know, Aww. and so on and so forth. So <laughs> that's about as much as you're going to get from me. My, my reading is about kindergarten level, it has to be said. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And um, I, was, I was watching your, um, same thing again, um, you took a group of people for um, study, holiday or for food or something. And they were around you and took some more pictures with them as a whole family thing. And I did also see some of your, your younger kids were there too. If you could share their experience, because they're born here, they went to Bangladesh. And one of them is Jessica, right? Yes, our daughter okay. is Jessica, yeah. And you know, I went Sam. to her Facebook and she said, I'm from Dinajpur. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And shocked my life off. Honestly, shocked my life that, why would she put Dinajpur, not UK? That means, actually, she meant it, honestly. Absolutely, yeah. Yes, completely. So if you could please tell me about them. <sighs> um, I think, really, I, I say our, our children were, when we first went out in 2006, they would have been three and five. Jessica, in fact, turned six. I, w- I will name them Shunarim, I will name them Shunarim Anush. <laughs> <laughs> honestly, honestly, it's amazing. Yes, indeed, yeah. Well, they, uh, so they were very young, you know, Sam was absolutely, he was barely walking in a sense, mm. really, when, uh, when we first went out there. Uh, and they loved it, and we came out for a second year in, in 2007, and then we finally moved there in 2008. But even in 2008, Sam by that point was just five years old, and Jessica had just turned eight years old. And so they, they did their growing up. They turned into adults, basically, in Bangladesh. They went from little children to adult, young adults in Bangladesh. So yeah, they're, I think even now, although they've got used to be living in the UK again, and they're quite happy here, they still see themselves as Bangladeshis, mm. you know, in many respects. Yeah, very much so. I think they, <coughs> it's very interesting to look at them as people because they have grown as a mix, a true mix of both cultures. Um, Sam couldn't remember being in England before Bangladesh because he was too little. Jess had a little bit of a memory of England and then they have all the time in Bangladesh with the discussions by Skype or certain trips that we took back and then they came back to England and had to understand a new culture because this was new for them and both of them see themselves as what's called a TCK which is third culture child um, and third culture kid and that means that a mix they become a, their own culture a Banglish I guess <laughs> uh, Banglish <laughs> mix um, which which makes for very interesting political views and their views on life and theories are very different to what mine are and when we have conversations I sometimes think I'm, I'm not sure where you're coming from but I can understand why you've got there and sometimes well most of the time their views actually enrich mine um, rather than it just mm. being a different view. You must be very proud of them. Very proud of them, yes. They've both done very well. Because those people can change the world, because they're seeing the both sides of the life. Mm. Yeah, and people will buy that, because they are honest, and they're just saying what they really mean when they say, I'm Bangladeshi, or I like Bangladesh. Not many people will say that. They don't have to. But they are proud, and they just saying what's in their heart, actually. And I think one of the things about LAM and the children that grow up through LAM is that they're all very, very proud of Bangladesh. They're um, bilingual. The children that are coming out of Lamb School are amazing. They can swap languages mm-hmm. like this. Two, three, um, four languages. Yeah, they can easily. Speak easily yeah. Um, and those are the children. A lot of them have stayed in um, Bangladesh, in Dhaka, to grow their um, qualifications where they're at. And they, they speak with our children on Skype across the miles and they meet up when they can. And just the, the, the world isn't big to them. It's a very, very small gap between the two countries because they've always done that. That's how they've lived. If I could ask uh, Ken, um, regarding your views on a global village, we live in a global village. It's true though at the moment. That's how you, that's, that's a beautiful word to use. 
Yeah. That's the way I think that's how a human should see things. Yes. Yeah. Yes, very definitely. I, I say I'm a very relational kind of person, so I, I'm the kind of person that makes connections between where I am and where other people are. So going out to Bangladesh, which was such a, an alien culture, so, so completely um, uh, different to what I'd grown up with, um, th that was a, that you know, really shocked me and it challenged me, but it held a mirror up to my own culture. Uh, it made me a lot more critical of being um, English, um, of, the, of British history, uh, our involvement in the world, our attitude about other people. But it also made me very grateful for my culture. I'm very proud to, to be an Englishman, you know, and I'm very proud of my own culture and uh, history as well. But it's not without being aware that it has faults and that there are things that are not good here. And I, sometimes I can be accused of having a bit of a kind of a, a rose-tinted spectacles with, with Bangladesh, but I'm not. I'm very, very aware of the problems in Bangladesh, and th there are huge numbers of, uh, of issues and difficulties. And I think well-educated Bangladeshis know that. They know those problems, and there are people far better, better qualified than me to, to, to be talking about those and, and dealing with those issues. Instead, my viewpoint is there, there are some fantastic things about Bangladeshi culture. There's some fantastic things about the people, and we need to learn from that. And this is what I, I guess our children have done, this TCK idea, third culture kid. It's taking the best of both worlds. And that's something I would encourage young Bangladeshis you know, in, in this country, British Bangladeshis, um, and Bangladeshis who have, who have come from, uh, from Bangladesh, self born, maybe raised there, but then come to, to live here. And that's absolutely fine, there's no, there's no problem with that. Uh, but I think it's very easy to then kind of turn you back on Bangladesh and say, oh, the, the, I, I'm, there's all those problems, all those difficulties, I'm glad I'm here, um, this is so much better. Uh, and I think that's just kind of, you know, building into a kind of a, a you know, you, you're will, becoming a willing slave almost, you know, to, to the mentality of West is best. Actually, I think, be proud of both be able to, to acknowledge that there are some fantastic, wonderful things, there's such a rich heritage of Bangladesh, and an amazing culture, an amazing language, you know, which people literally died for, as we know, for, you know, Kushi February and everything, um, that in order to, you know, to save the, the, the language itself, uh, and it's a beautiful language, you know, there's no doubt about that, uh, fantastic music, great Art, poetry, just it, it's a it's a, a land of lovers, you know, in many in many respects, in terms of the the art and culture there. Some people will, so do, some Bangladeshis are looking and saying to him, which part of the Bangladesh is he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> but it, it I want to go there. It's there. It is there. Okay, so a lot of our young people, like you said, yeah. uh, we have a lot of identity. Mm. They mix of ideas because they born here, there is a third generation here, mm. and. They haven't been there. They don't know what's going on. And the, everything they see in the TV, like everybody else, oh, there is a corruption there. Mm. They're fighting over politics. There is um, always a political problems and all that stuff. That's what they. W that's the only thing we get to see. We don't get to see the, what you're saying, honestly. Mm. So, say imagine that we go to Bangladesh, so for a holiday. Where would you you know, advise our young people to go and visit? Oh my goodness. Villages. Yes. Doesn't really matter where. But stay away from cities, stay away <laughs> from towns, go to the villages, go to the heart of Bangladesh. I, I don't know what the current statistic is, but certainly up to a few years ago, it was something like 70% of the population are still rural, um, rural based. They, they live literally off the land. It's not the 30% who are in the cities, you know, making the money and things like that. 70% of the people are in the villages working from the land directly, that is actually still the true Bangladesh, statistically as well as the heart and the culture. Uh, so yes, go to the villages, actually see what's Have at the heart met, of Bangladesh. Have you met famous um, people in Bangladesh like uh, prime ministers or ministers or they come to you? Have you met? Never. I have. Have you? Yeah, I, I had uh, dinner with the Minister of Health when we were setting up a, um, a rolling club foot programme called Walk for Life which was um, to correct club feet deformity Do throughout they the country. You? Do they give you some funding? The, it's a 50-50 partnership. So the government have done 50% and the um, NGO has done 50%. Um, and it's a true partnership. So we use government facilities to with um, NGO workers and materials and the publicity is done as a joint. It, it really is quite special. It's not one that I've heard much similar um, models in Bangladesh. 
That's amazing. I didn't know that, that they, they fund as well. That's great to know. Mm -hmm. There's some amazing stuff. Um, so my younger sons, they haven't been there. What would you say to them, uh, Ken? How would you approach them to go to Bangladesh and visit? Imagine millions are watching yeah. from the Europe and the America. They don't, they're not very fond of, because they haven't seen it, to be honest with you. Like me, I haven't seen the... I've seen the beauty a bit, not like you have, actually, mm. so how would we... I would certainly encourage anybody who ha comes from a Bangladeshi background but has never been to the country to go at least once. Um, at least at an age where they're going to be able to remember. I think sometimes you know, kids get taken when they're maybe three or four years old and they're not going to remember it years later and they're, or they're going to only have a very poor memory of it and maybe just remember the dust and the sand and the heat and the noise and things like that. Um, go at a point very definitely when you're old enough to be able to remember the sights and the sounds. That would be the first thing I would say. And I would, I would say to everybody, go at least once in your life. Um, and if necessary, yeah, do the tourist thing, um, but, but go to the very best places. You, you can't get much more beautiful than the Shundabans. Mm. Um, Shundabans the Shundabans are just uh, an amazing area. Go, go do a boat trip on the Shundabans, go live on a boat for a few days or a week, whatever, and go looking for the tigers on the, on the beach and the crocodiles in the river and things like that. Um, it's your archetypal Bangladeshi experience. If you're going to do the touristy thing, I would say definitely go there. You know, that, that's the place to be. Um, but go there looking not for the problems, not for the difficulties, not for the issues. They're there in abundance. You can see those, you know, you can read about them in the newspapers and things like that. Go looking deeper, go looking for the good stuff uh, because it actually, there's much more of that. Uh, that's why we say go to the villages where for most of the time it's, it's a day-to-day -day life that people are working in the fields, they're working in the homes, they're, um, they're, you know, the kids are going to school and coming back and it's just about life in that village and just looking at the peace and the tranquility that is there for most of the time and soak that up because we lose that in this country. Mm. Uh, it was one of the hardest things we tried to keep hold of when we came back saying, oh, you know, I'm not going to be pushed by time. I'm going to try and keep that Bangladeshi mentality of, we call it Bangla Shamoy, <laughs> that, just that kind of flexible whenever it's going to be. And you can't. The British mentality is everything on time and everything rushed and technology comes in supposedly to help you. But what it means is actually you can now do more in your work time and you're not mm. allowed to take breaks. And I know people who work for seven hours and they're not allowed to take a lunch break, you know, because they're not mm. full and they're not working for a full day. And their employers are taking advantage of that and not letting them do that. And that's going on here totally different in Bangladesh. There, there are freedoms there. There are wonderful things that you can just embrace and enjoy. And for me, one of them is just relaxing, just being able to kind of as know, a teacher, take that gentle time. As a teacher, what would you change in you know, Bangladeshi state schools? Uh, because you've seen the both sides of the world. I have, yeah. Okay. And as a friend of Bangladeshi, you are Bangladeshi as well, but you're welcome. Please tell us, what, do you, what would you change if you want to change anything? I think one of the, the biggest problems with Bangladesh education is that there's still a lot of corruption and a lot of it is kind of almost institutionalizing the minds of people. Um, I would make sure that teachers are paid a very decent wage so that they don't have to do private tuition because unfortunately there's an ingrained um, ethos there very much now that uh, the teachers in the classroom don't cover all the curriculum, they don't teach well, sometimes they don't even turn up in the classes. I've heard this time and time again. And so the children, you know, and we're talking older students, teenagers doing, you know, the, the HSCs, the SSCs, or the O levels and A levels, you know, depending on which system they, they're working through, they don't get the teaching they need, and so they have to get private tuition, often with the very same teachers that mm. aren't giving the teaching yeah. properly in the first place. And that's become so institutionalized, that's the way that teachers are making their living, very often because they're actually not earning a decent enough wage to be able to live without doing that. That needs to change. The whole mentality needs to change. Do you think, do you think it's change. improved last five years? No. He hasn't improved. No. I, I, if anything, I, I think it, it's an even worse situation. I even know it of uh, former students for, from our school, and students not from our school, it's not just to, to do with the English national curriculum as, as, as the Lamb School did, but even from the Bangla national curriculum, I know students who are at university now being put under pressure to have private lessons. That's just, uh, that's a nonsense that you would never hear of in this country, you know, that you wouldn't be getting students having private lessons from their lecturers at university. 
they'd be going to the lectures, they'd mm. be going to the seminars, they'd be doing the, the learning there, and then they would go and do their exams, and they were expected to do that by themselves. And they have been doing that since they were doing the A-levels and the GCSEs, you know. Yes, getting the support, but, and, and sometimes, yes, you know, I do a little bit of private tutoring in, in this country, but that's for somebody who's really struggling at maths and they just get a, a tutor for that, or, or somebody who's really struggling with a particular subject area, and they, or maybe a teacher's been ill and they've, they've had substitute teachers, and for one reason or another, they've got a real genuine struggle. In Bangladesh, it's just a blanket. Yeah, you've got, you've yeah. got to have yeah. private tuition. It's just, you're never going to pass it's it. It's like everybody's do. doing it. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And, and I know students who have no problem with what they're learning. They're learning everything perfectly well. They're managing all the courses. And yet they've got this terrible fear that if they don't get private tuition, they're going to fail their courses. Yeah. You know. mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing your uh, thoughts. It's really honest as well. If I could ask um, Vicky, your f from your memories, the best thoughts of Bangladesh, what would it be? I think probably the best thoughts have to be the children in the rehab centre. Um, I worked in uh, um, I worked as the rehab lead for um, the physiotherapy in the hospital, but also the occupational therapy and the speech therapy with the children who have got cerebral palsy, developmental problems. Um, and when I started, it was very much a view in society that that was a shame. It was um, a shame on the mother for having a child who ha had struggles. Um, they used to be stories of children being locked away, um, tied to trees. Because Is it because of the they're disabled? Yeah, because they had a disability, because they couldn't control the behaviours, because they were shunned in society. Mm. Um, if a child had a hemiplegia and couldn't use their right hand, um, then they were fed because they they weren't allowed to use their left hand and that was how it was when I arrived and actually over the years that's changed and now they're starting to see more and more children who have been through rehab who have actually met their potential who still have the disabilities but can now actually function really well as part of society our and that's growing. Yeah, our prayers for you especially the things you have done. Mm -hmm. We only have um, one minute. Um, I want you to say your last word within 10 seconds to mm -hmm. our viewers. What would you say? Oh, um, I think I would probably say thank you to everyone in Bangladesh who gave us the opportunity to be part of their society and to help us to grow who we are as people. Can I want you something to your family as well, please, to our viewers as well? Oh, for my family, I'd say on next Donovad, uh, it's fair to say that in all the years that we lived in Bangladesh, Bangladesh gave much more to us than we gave to Bangladesh and to our family. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. Dear brothers and sisters, thank you for staying with us. We're going to go for a small break. And after the break, I'll see you after the break, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Dear viewers, welcome back. We're going to rush now. We've got new two guests, amazing young people in our show from Kunbin University. So if I could go to Sarah, Sarah, could, if you could introduce yourself to our viewers first. Yeah, my name is Sarah Barnes and I'm the Public Engagement Officer at Queen Mary University of London. Dan? And my name is Dan, I'm the Assistant Public Engagement Officer um, and we work within the Centre for Public Engagement um, of which the aim is to um, engage people outside higher education with research, teaching and the university um, in a wider sense. Fantastic. What's the number of a student in, in your university? It's massive, isn't it? It's about 21,000. Wow. So, yeah, quite a few. <laughs> Fantastic. So, you guys are promoting a, a community day. Yes. Uh, and there's, uh, this is coming on this Saturday as well. It's amazing. Um, please tell us about that day. Yeah. So, um, Queen Mary, um, as you maybe know, is based in East London. Um, and we've got a number of campuses, but um, one of our days is based in Stepney Green Park. So we're taking the fun day and the festival to the local community. It's in Stepney Green Park on the Saturday. And then on the Sunday, we're having a day where we're, we're inviting the community onto campus. So onto the Mylan campus in Queen Mary. So if I could ask the same thing to Dan, um, who are the target group you are targeting to yeah. come on that day? Well, um, basically, we, um, the festival is organised with community partners in Tower Hamlets, listening very much for 
um, people living um, and working and learning in Tower Hamlets. Um, we've got a huge range of activities over, um, I think in all, over um, 70 different stalls. Um, so there's really something for everyone, from family activities to um, um, hands-on research, um, and lots of community stalls um, of people talking about services and um, projects available um, for people in the local community to get involved with. So lots of things. Amazing. <laughs> well, Queen <laughs> University, they involve a lot of things, isn't it? They involve with Telco, the mm -hmm. citizen, mm -hmm. um, London citizen. Yes. Yeah. They also are campaigning for safety road or safe yes. road. That recently there was there are a lot of people actually incident happened. Yeah, I actually think that was a project that was done in partnership with uh, London citizens mm. as well, yeah, with our students. Yeah, that, it's, it's amazing. So how do you handle those 21,000 of young people there? I mean... <laughs> uh, well, um, not all of them live on campus. <laughs> okay. um, we have quite a small student village where a number of them live on campus. And um, then the rest of them live maybe further afield in London and they commute in. And we also have a huge staff population um, and we work mostly with um, everyone from sort of PhD students to academics and then the professional staff who kind of make the university work as well. Do you feel as a young person that there's a gap here, like old and young people, generational gap, do you feel that? Possibly, but I don't think necessarily that's one of the biggest gaps that there are in society. Um, I think ma perhaps maybe kind of wealth is maybe a bigger gap compared to the age gap and the divisions that it creates. If you could give us a, a um, explain it a bit more. Well, more I mean, for example, in, in Tower Hamlets. People are watching for America, they want to ah, know. Well, <laughs> exactly America. Uh, well it, particularly in East London, for example, okay. we've got Canary Wharf, um, which is a huge financial district um, where people earn huge salaries and um, East London um, has areas of deprivation yeah. um, and people for instance definitely don't earn the salaries, not everyone anyway, the salaries that you get in Canary Wharf. And unpl unemployment for young people is high, mm. it's massive and as soon as they look at the, the building, at the higher building, they say well, what's going on, nothing to do with me, I don't know where these people are coming from, I don't know where they are and who yeah. they are, that, that is a gap. Um, do you feel it's a gap? Like we, uh, I'm from second generation of especially Bangladeshis and, and then third generation. We do find a gap here from the first and the third. They mm. don't speak the same language. Not mm. everybody does. Mm. The older w b version, they, they speak Bangla. And then we have a proper English, Cockney English, that means. <laughs> <laughs> Cockney English. And then there's a gap here we find is there. But it's, it's good, like the things you guys are doing, actually bringing everyone together, they will find a solution. Do you feel like there's a gap? I feel like, um, in general, when you're talking about all these areas, um, there are, there's always gaps, but it's always things which it's possible by working together, um, it's possible to address. So you talk about, say, um, old and young. Um, I can talk very specifically about things that happen at the university, where there's a lot of um, projects which are trying to bring students into um, spaces with older people to work together. Um, the festival, the two days of the festival, they intend to try and bring people um, from any backgrounds, whether it be staff and students, um, although a lot of our students are actually um, from Tower Hamlets, so they're also um, locals as well. Um, but bring them together with people living um, across the road in places like Ocean's Estate, um, further afield across Tower Hamlets. And what we find in all these projects is that there's originally this, um, you can have an idea that there might be a gap. But actually when you get people together, you see that actually everyone's got those shared values um, and very quickly those gaps start to melt away in terms of um, barriers to communicating. There's a lot of work to be done though, especially as Sam said, mm. in terms of that, um, that pay gap. Um, it's something which the university is doing um, um, certain projects to try and address and bring people together, but it's Tower Hamlets in particular is a borough which has a particularly large gap in that way, as Sarah said, between places like um, Canary Wharf, which is so high earning, and then um, and then wider Tower Hamlets, which covers actually quite a lot of quite a lot of London. Recently, we've seen um, there are a lot of young people involved in knife crime. Mm. There are a few murders that happened as well. A uh, few weeks or a month ago, the young man, actually he died in his mother's arm. And, or oh, he's Bangladeshi, of course. 
mm. and um, the knife crime has gone high in, in other places of uh, London as well. As a young person, do you feel scared? Do you feel reserved? What, what's your feelings? Mm, I've lived in East London and Tower Hamlets for 10 years now, maybe slightly longer, um, and I don't necessarily feel scared, actually. I think of all the places that I've kind of been in London, Tower Hamlets really feels like it has that sense of community and that kind of people feel maybe that they're looking out for each other and that people are proud, I think, to live in Tower Hamlets. And so I, I don't really feel scared, but um, I understand that maybe some people do. And often I think it depends. I mean, I'm very fortunate that I went to university and, you know, and, and I'm You did employed. study at uh, Queen Mary as well? I did study at Queen so Mary So you know that well, yes. idea very well. But yes. we do have some issues, like, I don't know how our leaders are seeing it, but we do have... Uh, uh, crime rate is going high, there's a drugs dealings, there is, um, you name them, almost everything's happening around us. And still there, are we doing enough, you think, as the community leaders or community activists that we can, we should do something together as a, as a community? I think um, there's always more that can be done. I think it's a matter of all coming together and talking about these openly and um, having those conversations so you can go back and um, use them to talk to people who you think um, might be in trouble, who might be scared of these kind of things. I think getting people together to talk about these is the most important thing, really. So that first of all we're doing on this Saturday, is that for young people or is it for everybody? It's for everyone, but there, um, a lot of the activities have been designed with young people in mind. So people could come with their families. So Absolutely. the father could come, the mother could come. Absolutely. And have some also. Um, families is really is a really great way actually because you know there may be things that that parents understand and there may be things that children really are more into. Um, we've got lots of family friendly activities as well, things like bouncy castles and face painting, um, as well as talks about our research and things like that. So are, are really. Are we going to have a live difference. music or anything? Yes. We are. On the, um, on the Saturday in particular, um, Spotlight, which is a youth centre yeah. Um, yeah, um, in Langdon Park, they're going to be having a stage takeover. So for um, two or three hours, they're going to have local young people um, doing performances um, from soul um, to rap through to rock music. And um, we're going to have a Russian choir. And then at the end, we're going to have the People's Assembly who are going to be doing live karaoke with a live band. And people can sign up and um, do karaoke there on the stage. So we're both providing entertainment and hopefully wow. people will come and provide their own. Let's, do, let, let's hope we have a, a, a sunny day. We're hoping it is going to yes, be sunny. It is. We've been looking at the weather every okay, day. I'm just going to take a call. Hello, mm. caller. As salamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam. Um, who's that? And where are you calling from, please? Uh, it's Yasmin, actually. Oh, mashallah. Yasmin, how are you? I'm good. I'm watching from home right now. That's great. Um, with my family and everyone. So we asked Dan to dance, but he's not dancing, is he? <laughs> <laughs> no, he's not. Uh, just, um, great show, guys. I just wanted to ask a question of um, a bit of understanding of why the university is putting on um, the festival. I think it would be good to understand what's the background knowledge of it. Yeah, could you say a few, few lines? Absolutely. Um, so we've got a number of different aims, but one of them is really to bring the community and the university together. So we really want to bring our staff and our students together with the local community, people who live in East London, who maybe walk past Queen Mary every day, but don't know what we do, maybe what we research or, or why we look at the things that we look at and what the students are learning. So all of those things, we'd like to bring those together. And I think our students and staff have as much to learn from the community as the community has to learn from our students and staff. Amazing. Yasmin, are you still uh, here? Yeah, I'm still here. Thank you for that. Okay. What's for Dan? He's going to get upset if you're going to ask him something. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to start dancing. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, yeah, so it would be interesting to understand. The university is based in East London, and the, it's not like any other universities that I've come across that engage with the local community. Why is it that the university has that interest in the community? Um, well, it seems very much from our origins. So, um, um, at the history of Queen Mary University of London, um, we're told to always say the whole name, which is very long. Um, but originally, it was built as the People's Palace, 
which was um, created to benefit the people of East London with entertainment and education. And we still very much feel that in the way that um, the university is run. And luckily, it's something which runs through all of our departments, all of our faculties. And um, we very much feel like a university in and of our community, rather than just um, you know, being a kind of place here. We very much, we very much, a lot of our students are based in Tower Hamlets. A lot of our staff have commitment to projects going on here. We're very lucky that it's running through the whole life of our institution. Yasmin, can I, if I could ask you something, if you're still there? Yeah. Recently, yeah. you've been campaigning, um, I mean, regarding the knife crime that yeah. happened. So if you could tell us um, how, what you have done recently, uh, how well, far did you go? Um, so we were contacted by the family of Sai Jamnor, and it was actually an interest in the local community by both parents, even students from the university contacted us and said, we want to do something about this issue. The students live in the area as well. They're worried about what will happen to them. There's been instances in the past as well. And so what we did was we brought together a campaigns team with the family and we did an action where we did a rally in Altabali Park. We had over 400 people. The mayor of the borough was there. MP Roshnaro was there. And we basically got commitments from those in power to do some form of social change. And we asked for the first um, task force to be set up here in Tower Hamlet before we set up in London um, with <coughs> the community enforcement officers and um, the councillors as well. So we've set up a task force with the council. We're working with the community to design and act on the issues that matter to the local people. So we're looking at preventative measures. And it's about how can we get the community involved to make social change happen. Fantastic. Um, and we've had students from the university and staff members that have been part of this whole process. Thank you very much for your call as well. I think we appreciate your call. That's fine. Thank Great you. to see you guys there. Inshallah. Asalaamu Alaikum. <laughs> She's amazing, actually. She does amazing stuff, man. She's so great. Um, yeah, I mean, she's always doing something. Isn't it? I've never seen her um, sit back and saying, let, let it happen. <laughs> I've never seen that. If I could ask Dan, um, there are a lot of young people are watching, actually. So especially uh, Malaysian Muslim community uh, uh, mm. young people are in Tower Hamlet a lot. So they are, somehow they feel they're not being seen as they stand for. Like you watch, you open a paper and you say, Muslims are extremists, Muslims are this, Muslims are that, and they've been looked down onto. That's that's media. That's not everybody actually. This mm -hmm. is a it's a beautiful place to live in UK, and um, they only always think and they look back and say, oh, it's not me then. It's not my place. What would you say to those young people? I'd say that. Um the media is not necessarily always going to be the thing. It, it has to cover things with a very broad brush and it doesn't do that very well a lot of the time. And the ma it's a matter of you are the person who's responsible for your own destiny. Don't listen to um, the media and um, create, have that create a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy based on what they say. We've got so many great things that people are involved with in um, East London here. Um, we work with charities such as Smiling Community Project, which are bringing um, a lot of um, boys and girls, men and women, um, from Bangladesh Bangladeshi backgrounds in East London together to create um, films and community projects. And a lot of those address those stereotypes. So um, definitely have a look at Marlin Community Project and see the work they do. They've done particularly um, short films um, about uh, people's stereotypes of young people, um, particularly in East London, um, stereotypes of why are all these young people going to chicken shops? And they actually, <laughs> they've got a short um, film called Chicken Shop, which is about why actually it's a place where people come together. And um, I think the work they do is great in addressing those stereotypes um, from the perspective of young people. And it's just one of the many things which you can get involved in to start pushing back on stereotypes that you feel are being addressed. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, if I could ask a lot of young uh, l women or ladies, I'm assuming, uh, looked down on because of their dress code. Mm. You know, like, to be fair with them, like if somebody wants to wear a certain dress code, if it doesn't affect anyone, I mean, let it be. You know, let it be, I think, that let it be. But if that affects something, of course, we need to look into it. It's not a problem. Mm. And they are somewhat downhearted. Oh, I can't go there, I'm religious, or I can't be there because of my dress. 
and they somehow are moving away from the higher education and because of the fees as well. There are a lot of young people are not going to university because of the fees. Mm. What would you say to those young people as a young person yourself? Um, well, firstly, in terms of women's dress code, I would say that it's, it's not really anybody else's business what you wear apart from your own. And so I would say as a woman, um, unless for some reason, you know, for some safety reason, you can't wear a thing, then you have every right to wear what you want to wear, whether or not uh, it's a headscarf or you want to wear a skirt. That's, you know, yours. And for tuition fees, um, the rise in tuition fees has been an issue and I know that many many universities um, every university in fact has to put in place ways to help people who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford to go to university so um, there are um, ways that a university that you want to go to may be able to help you and also um, although there are tuition fees they are provided as loans and the loans are um, you don't have to pay them back until you have a job when you graduate um, I paid tuition fees and I do think it's worth it um, so it's not money you're going to have to find up front but do you, you think it's affecting it people though there are people are coming the, the, the number is coming down isn't it I don't actually know if the number is coming down I think people are still going to university um, more than certainly a long time ago um, I think people are thinking twice about the courses they would study, so that people instead are looking at why they're studying what they're going to study and is it going to help me in the future, will I get a good job from it? Um, so it, that might be the shift that people are perhaps choosing subjects that they'll know will get them a good job, which means when they pay it back in the future it will be easier. Fantastic. If I could ask Dan. Dan, why... Um, why do you, a lot of young people like you guys are doing community work? I mean, Voluntarily, I mean, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Uh, you could have done a lot of other stuff. And if we all done it together, I think it would have been an amazing place to live on because everyone's doing community work, then doing something good, and then soon they want to change people's life. Mm. What makes you come out and do this kind of stuff? It's, I mean, selfishly, it's very rewarding. <laughs> 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 but um, it's fantastic. I mean, partly it's the people. Like, um, the community projects before I started in my job here and then during my, my job at Queen Mary, um, the people that you get involved with are really inspirational and um, to be honest some of them the amount of time they put in I'm like you I'm like how do you have the time you talk about um, Yasmin who goes above and beyond um, Marlin Community Project again their directors do so much work and it's just seeing being able to work with those inspirational people and seeing the effect that they actually have all the conversations that we're having here um, it's through that voluntary work that people are addressing those issues they're closing gaps, they're addressing stereotypes and I think it's really rewarding to be part of that effort and it's why I've been glad to be able to be part of them and I'm proud to be working at a university which is actively um, working on those pro projects and involving people who are volunteering um, to address all of these issues and bring them into the university. How many people are you expecting in the, on Saturday and Sunday? What's your expectation? We hope, well last mm -hmm. year, this is the second year we've had this, um, last year we had 3,000 people, so we hope more than 3,000 people. You must all come along. <laughs> um, and it is, it's very much a family festival. We have, as we said, inflatables, face painting, things for children, but also so many fun facts, um, talks. Um, last year we had, it's hard, it's hard to say, it's basically everyone. Last year we had students, we had um, local elders, we had local families. Um, they're really listening for everyone, so we're hoping to see um, visitors that really reflect the diversity of the borough that we live in. Um, um, do you need volunteers for the day or do you get enough volunteers? <laughs> <laughs> Everything, <laughs> fingers crossed, is pretty much sorted. Um, so um, for now I would say just come along and next year if you want to volunteer, please do, we'd be more than grateful. Mm. Um, we had so many volunteers. Yeah, that's we put out a call. No, that's good, actually. We had so many, many of our wonderful <laughs> students are helping mm. out. So it's it's good to see a lot of young people are nowadays mm. that they're very well in education. Mm. In Tahoe especially, they're very good in GCSEs and A-levels. And they, 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 a lot of especially young people are coming out and they want to do this kind of stuff. But they're struggling with finding a jobs, man. My, mm. I have a second boy, he's, he's 19. He's doing his first year in university. Mm. About three months now, he's trying for a job. It's difficult to find. Mm. 
you know. Um, so what would you advise to those young people who are looking for a job, if you have any advice for them? Where um, do they go? What kind of stuff they need to look into? I think there's a lot about trying to find, because um, studying and getting the ed education is vital, but also finding the ways to uh, um, apply those. Um, going out, getting Saturday jobs so you can gain transferable skills um, for people who are in their first year at university. Consider things like work placement years um, if you're able to. Um, so really try and find ways to start applying your work. Also, um, your former question, um, volunteering is a really <laughs> great way to gain those mm. skills. So um, again, I keep going back to the, the reasons it's good for you. but. Um, Going out and volunteering really gives you peop the people skills, the organisation skills, which help you in a CV. They show you're willing to go that extra mile, um, and they do really help. But a lot of young people, they, when, when they, as soon as they hear volunteer, I'm not going to pay it, I'm not going to do it. You know, like this hesitation they have. Mm. How do we break that down? Because without volunteering, you're not going to have no experience. You're not going to meet people. You're not going to find a way mm. of your life you're looking for. Mm. You, break, you, you meet these kind of people who change your life for you. So how do you break that down? Because young people say, oh, I'm not coming because I'm not going to get paid. I mean, it doesn't work. I think um, there are lots and lots of different ways that you can volunteer. So it's not just, I guess, the stereotype. If you could give an example of yourself, say you volunteer something and that changed your thing or how you see things. Um, how I have. Yeah, so when I was a young person, when I was a teenager, I volunteered through a kind of a local youth council and we did lots of um, working with our local council um, to kind of advise on young people's services and um, get funding for young people's services and things like that. And that really gave me loads of confidence. Um, and from that, I went on to be a trustee of a charity. And again, wow. that was a different insight to something that I never would have normally done. Um, and it was a young people's charity as well. Um, so they had a, a board of trustees that were all under 30. Um, which was um, scary, I guess, for them to put their trust in a whole bunch of young people to be their trustees. But it was brilliant. Um, and that was skills that I never would have got anywhere else. You know, how often can you say, oh, I'm 19 and I sit on the board of yeah. trustees for a national charity? So there's more than one way of getting mm. involved, I think, with volunteering. You have to find kind of the volunteering thing that's right for you. So maybe you don't, you're not a fan of physical activity, but maybe you love sport. And Lots of our students, for example, run, volunteer and run community sport clubs for young people where they're, they're teaching you know, school kids how to play football and doing training clubs and that sort of thing. So there is always ways that you're, you know, maybe you're in really interested in computer programming and coding and what you can do is kind of work with other young people and teach them coding and programming skills. Um, maybe you like reading, you volunteer mm. in your local library, loads of different ways. And it matures you, isn't it? You work with somebody expert and you work with them and it changes your, the way you see things. Mm. And you think, wow, that person can do that, I could do it too. You know, like your childness goes away. I mean, the crazy childness, mm. oh, I don't like anyone, I don't like <laughs> anything. But you get to learn with people with the expertise and, and like yourself, you said you become a, a board member of mm. when you were young. That's and I think it's as well, when you work with people who are outside of the people who have known you when you're growing up as a teenager, almost, I think there's an awkwardness, isn't there? When everyone has known you since you were a kid, you can't then become your own person yeah. because you kind of worry that they're still seeing you as a child. Um, so you go out and you volunteer and you meet other adults and wow. they start talking to you as an adult. You're That's like, point, hey, actually, yeah. I can be this, you know, you find out who you are then as an adult rather than the kid you've always been growing up. That's amazing, actually. I, what happened, I, I think when I was about, 20, about 30 years old that time, and actually uh, I walked in a place and that person actually made me feel like something special. Mm. And I always look back and say, actually, I, I've seen him afterward. I said, you know what? I was, of course I was, old, I was okay, but when I was working with you, you made me feel something different. I felt confidence, I felt this, I felt that. Because I've seen something else, I've become mature. Mm. Knowing somebody trusts you, and you know it makes you do, let you do what you want to mm. do, yeah. not what he wants you to do. Let you do what you want to, even if you make mistakes. And through, especially like you work with someone you don't know, that can happen. Yeah. Expectation is not there, so yeah. you, uh, less headache or less pressure probably. Mm. If I could ask you a uh, question here, if I could ask you to say to our viewers, especially young people are watching now, that they're finding difficult to find jobs. Wh where do they go look for jobs? And your last message to our viewers. 
It's a good question. Um, they're out there. It's a matter of it can be it can be difficult. Um, it's persevering. It's going and finding those practical skills. As we've said today, um, volunteering doesn't have to be something which is scary. It can be something which is actually something which is based around skills you want. In East London, there's so many things. If you're into media, we have media um, opportunities. If you're into um, coding, we've got a place that can do that. So it's, it's finding those skills, trying and persevering. It's not an easy thing. Your last word with them, anything? Um, thank you for listening to us. Um, hopefully we'll see you at the Festival Communities this weekend. It's yeah. on Saturday the 20th in Stepney Green Park and then at the Queen Mary University of London campus on Mile End Road. It's the one with the big clock tower. Um, on Sunday the 21st, um, there'll be something for everyone, family activities, Brilliant. fun facts, and community stalls. Fantastic. Your last word, 10 seconds. Come to the festival. It's <laughs> so much It's so fun. easy. I'm going to say the same thing. Yes, <laughs> let's just hope it doesn't rain. If you can mm. hope it won't rain for us, that would be it's really helpful to too. It's supposed to be dry. <laughs> but we also have indoor activities. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'm, I'm really, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Dear brothers and sisters, thank you for staying with us. I really enjoyed um, the show today, especially. It's two different things. In UK, we are trying to connect people, and in Bangladesh, Ken and Ina Vicky are uh, trying to connect people there too. So may Allah bless everybody, and see you next week, inshallah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.